Holden Triplett. You heard this specific description of the course of events. I want to get your take. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, let me just start off by saying I am not with the government, nor do my, my views are my own at this point. I'm not representing the views of uh, the U.S. government or the FBI specifically. Um, so I, I think maybe we can just take a step back. I, I'm not sure if what we want to do up here is sort of completely litigate the, the specifics of the case. Um, and, and just think about what we're actually dealing with here. And, and I think it's important to think of the entire narrative and the arc of, what we're, of the, the organization. Um, and that helps inform how, why the government is so concerned about this. And what we have essentially is an organization that has called itself essentially an intelligence agency that is trying to inform the, the people of the world and has said that they want to hack to, to bring that information out and to publish it. Now, again, this is an organization that has generally been you know, used against a number of different governments within the world, but has worked specifically very hard against the U.S. government. It is not a U.S. entity. Assange is not a U.S. citizen. So again, injecting themselves in our conversation here, in our uh, you know, dynamic of, of figuring out what is the balance between security and privacy, in a sense. And so I think it's important to think about who is the actor that we're talking about here um, before we start to get into the specifics of, about what might be misconceptions that are out there. So there's two basic charges within the superseding doc. Um, well, there's 18 charges, but two basic ones, which essentially is there's a computer hacking charge, and then there's the charges under the Espionage Act. And so, as, as Barry laid out, there is a, a uh, at least a, a narrative that's out there about whether or not the hacking, how big of a play, uh, part that played in the overall exploitation of receiving information, or whether it was a, a part of it that was necessary in order to get the information out. But I'm not sure if that actually matters for whether or not the case, if someone actually has broken the law in order they're making an attempt to actually uh, extract additional information. So while it may or may not be, and again, I think we should stay kind of a little bit on the wave tops here on the specifics of this, um, may or may not be actually impactful on the information that's coming out, if Assange took these actions, essentially was encouraging someone and actually trying to help them to hack into a US government system, that is a violation of US law. And that is not someone who is protected in terms of pu publishing that information. Um, generally, that is uh, not something that the Supreme Court has decided to protect in those types of actions. And the second, what is a, a very nuanced and complicated piece of it, I don't know the specifics of this, um, but I can tell you what it smells like. It smells like an intelligence operation to me. Um, it, this is a very typical sort of tactic of how Russian intelligence works. Um, they use individuals and they use people to as proxies and many times they may be unwitting in which ways they would do that. Sometimes they may be witting in order to leak this type of information. Um, so creating a situation where there was a supposed, it was told it was a temporary password to some person so that they could you know, push this information out versus saying that it was a, a, a permanent password that could be unchanged. This is the type of information that uh, a Russian intelligence service, so this is how they would operate in order to push that information out. Um, really quickly, uh, with the names that were ultimately revealed in the unredacted versions, uh, was there any harm done to anybody? So I, I think that in, in my information is anecdotal. I have people that I know that were undercover, um, friends um, that were revealed, um, that then felt unsafe in doing their job and trying to protect U.S. national security. Um, there's untold number of other people. Um, so if you remember what was essentially revealed was the identity of some um, individuals in the U.S. government who were undercover, um, some individuals who were working with the U.S. government in different parts of the world, um, and those, a lot of those identities were revealed. So these are people who were in um, substantial danger. Um, they were providing assistance to the U.S. government, and their information was leaked out. So, and as Barry mentioned, although there may have been an attempt to limit that at the beginning, once the information was out, WikiLeaks was happy to publish it on their own website. So again, I think it kind of gets to the underlying of what, is, what was WikiLeaks' intentions all along in this, in this instance. But I think there's some real substantial harm here. And again, this gets back to my earlier point. If we have an organization that's outside the United States, made up substantially of people who are not US citizens, making decisions about information that's going to be leaked that impacts Americans, impacts individuals who are working with the United States. And so I think the question we really should be asking is, is this the type of power that we want to give to someone outside of our government or outside of our society? This is not an American. This is not a U.S. organization doing this. It's an outsider. Gabe Rotman, do you believe that Julian Assange, considering the allegations, 
is a journalist. If we're talking about hacking, we're talking about names that have now been revealed as uh, informants in countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Iran. Uh, what do you think? So um, maybe I can start instead of directly answering that question um, uh, by setting the stakes, the, actual, the, the fundamental stakes in the case, I, I think, for journalism. Um, and I was going to start off this answer by preempting the question you just asked, is Julian Assange a journalist? And the answer is, respectfully, it doesn't really matter. The First Amendment doesn't protect journalists as an employment class. It doesn't, it doesn't protect, it protects individuals who do certain things, who engage in journalistic activity. So with that said, uh, if you look at especially national security reporting, reporting on federal law enforcement, you know, what is the life cycle of that, of that, that activity? You try and get the information, you pursue it. Um, occasionally you say, I'm interested in large classes of information, things like that. You receive the information and then you publish the information. Under US federal law, under the Espionage Act and actually under parts of the, CF, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, the, on the face of those statutes, that activity could potentially be criminal. Now, just to dig into the, the second superseding indictment, so there's three indictments here, it gets super complicated, but basically the last indictment against Assange, there are, let's say, three types of charges. One involves the computer intrusion conspiracy. Then there are a series of charges that are based on inchoate theories, in other words, conspiracy, aiding and abetting, um, solicitation. Uh, and then there are three charges that are based on only that third piece of the, of the journalistic activity, national reporting li life cycle, publication. They charge Assange directly for the sole act of publishing classified information online. Um, now, the government uh, has argued that, uh, and, and this is true on the face of the actual indictment, that they're only charging um, Assange for the publication of unredacted informant names. When you read it, that's true. Under the Espionage Act, informants is not a, a special class. There actually is a statute that covers the publication, uh, the identification of informants. That's not an issue here. The Espionage Act, by its plain terms, covers the publication of classified information to the public. The government um, has thought about uh, uh, prosecuting members of the news media uh, historically. There's a case in World War II um, where they were ultimately unsuccessful in getting an indictment against the Chicago Tribune and a Tribune reporter for releasing information about the Midway attack. Um, there are uh, a related set of cases in the 1970s and 1980s involving leaks concerning uh, a very secret uh, Soviet uh, submarine-based uh, surveillance program against the Soviets. Uh, the, that case went all the way up to the top levels of the Ford, uh, Ford administration, and ultimately the administration decided not to indict. But in all of those cases where it's come close, the government's never pushed over to charge pure publication, and that's what, what's at issue here. 